presentation is about the making of our language. And um, what I'm trying to do is to uh, coordinate with the objective of the colloquium in providing some education and generating some awareness on the languages that we speak. Um, there are many ways of doing this, but I will focus on it from the angle of population, uh, population change, and so on again. The, when I say our language, the language I'm talking about is the Creole language. Um, and you might, you, if you were here earlier this morning, uh, Professor Robertson gave his entire speech in Basilecan Creole to an audience consisting of speakers of indigenous languages, Creole and others. Um, so that is our language that we're talking about, the Creole language. Um, what I'm going to try to do is to, as I said, uh, follow a perspective of um, looking at population change and emergence in Guyana and putting side by side with that some general points about language development in Guyana. And through the history, we will show that the Creole was created by a number of different persons. Black persons, white persons, yellow, brown persons, all kinds of persons. And um, all of these persons, by coming here to Guyana under different circumstances and so on, etc., et um, all contributed to the development of our language. Um, some of these follows the language ecology or population genetics approach, and it has been used by a number of different language uh, linguists. Um, it also allows me to blend my own interest in Guyanese history, we are very interested in that, with my interest in linguistics, and also it gives us an understanding of our history, that we do have a history and it was a productive history, at least one of the things that we created uh, was this language. Now, some caveats. Population figures are not the only dimensions that we use in looking at language development. There are many other factors, I listed some of them here. The nature of the languages in contact, the nature of the speakers, the nature of the contact situation, the language learning, the language acquisitions process, social, environmental, psychological, and other factors, uh, the ratio of the contact speakers, the stability of the population, and in my, in my uh, presentation, I'll try to show uh, how this plays out. Uh, population growth, and so on. Um, a number of other factors, factors related to the speakers and the hearers. Um, as was pointed out earlier in the other presentations, our Creole is created out of contact between people. So the contact situation and the nature of that is very important. Um, the speed at which people speak, the hostility or the anxiety or the fear, um, language factors such as grammatical factors and similarities and differences and so on. Language learning factors, brain processes and all of that. Contact situation factors, what is the nature of the contact and so on. Now, all of these, all of these factors play some role. So this, this evolution and the development of this Creole language that we have been speaking about was a very, very complex um, difficult task. It wasn't just um, our forebears not being able to speak a European language. It was a complex task. And what we must realize is that our forebears didn't have bachelor's uh, university degrees or degrees in linguistics and all of that. They did all of this, as they say, on the natural. So yeah, I'm going to now look at some um, figures and trace. On the one side, you see some population figures on your left-hand side. On the right-hand side, you'll see some, some of the general implications for language development. So generally, uh, the Dutch were here from about 1600s along Escribo quarantine. And by 1616, they had established settlements in Escribo and later on in the Pomeroon. Um, many of them came from Brazil, and they had been established in Brazil before, so they brought the slaves with them. And they had as a matter of survival to relate to the Amerindians, even though they did try at some point to enslave Amerindians. Um, an edict was passed later that Amerindians would not be enslaved. 
Um, so again, there's people from Maroon from the 1600s, Dutch settlements. Now on the right hand side, this is the beginning of what we call the homestead phase. Uh, small groups of people living together. You have the Dutch, the Amerindians, and uh, slaves uh, living and trying to scratch out a living. Um, Dutch would have been the, the main language, but of course there were the Amerindian languages. And the Dutch would have learned some of the Amerindian languages in order to, to survive, to get food, etc., from the Amerindians. And the Dutch slaves, the slaves who came with the Dutch from Brazil, would have been speaking um, perhaps a Dutch Creole. Then the settlements moved to the Barbies River from about 1657. And again, in Barbies, you had Dutch and Amerindian languages coexisting, and also evidence that the Amerindians there also learned to speak some Dutch. From the 1660s, the English began arriving, first as raiders and invaders, and later they came to settle. And from about the 1740s, there was an influx of settlers in the Essequibo. In about 1746, concessions of land were given out in the Amurara. And by 1753, the English had become the majority in the Amurara. Um, Robertson points out that by 1762, 34 of the 93 plantations in the Amurara were English owned. Um, you had a general movement also of planters and slaves and freed Africans from the Caribbean. One thing you should realize is that Ghana came late to the plantation and colonizing uh, business. By the time we were being settled in the Caribbean islands, we had uh, plantations and settlements there for a number of years. So many of the planters were now moving to the new lands from Barbados, Antigua, Trinidad, Tobago, Nevis, etc. Now, on the right hand side, this was a period of coexistence of Dutch and English, and also um, Dutch Creoles in Esquibo and Barbies. And Robinson also makes a strong claim that there would have been a Dutch Creole in Demerara itself. Um, he spoke about Barbies, Dutch, and Skippy Dutch early this morning. But he also made an argument for a Dutch um, Creole existing in Barbies. And then the settlers who came from the Caribbean now, they brought a Creole English. So what we have now was a period of great linguistic diversity in this country that we call Ghana. Of course, it wasn't called Ghana as yet. The French came briefly, 1782, 84, with no lasting influence from them, even though we have French place names and so on. And then England, Ghana, the country was finally ceded to the British in 1814. But um, Anglicization of the language and the culture had begun from a long, long way back. So there's been a long influence of English, probably from the start of the 1800s. But so we had English as a now growing language, Dutch as a receiving language, Dutch Creole still existing, and also English Creoles. Uh, so a great linguistic diversity apart from the Amerindian languages. Uh, let's look a bit closer at the Africans. Um, at least one ship arrived with slaves in the Pomeroon around 1658, 1659 when the Dutch settlers were there. And after that, other ships um, came as the, as the farms expanded on um, Esquivel and Pomeroon. And that was the start of the slave trading again and the arrival of a large number of Africans. Um, there was a rapid growth of plantation, especially when, when the agriculture moved away from tobacco, etc., into sugar. There was a steep and rapid rise in the size and growth of plantation. And that led to the import of large numbers of laborers. And um, this caused a great demographic shift, with now the changing balance from more white population to a more black population with a particular locus of intermingling, and that was the plantation that you just heard about from um, Dr. Gibson. Um, so there was a rapid supply of slaves, but the slaves came by supply rather than natural increase. So slaves were here and they died. So the, the local black population was not really rising much. 
the, the black population is being filled by Africans, new Africans coming all the time. By 1769, there were only about 4,000 slaves in Mexico and 6,000 in Deborah. By 1802, about 8,000 slaves were coming for a year to Deborah, more than the whole population of Mexico and Deborah. By the abolition of the slave trade in 1807, we had about 109,000 slaves in Demerara and Sikribo. And by the 1890 slave census, you had 23,881 slaves in Barbies, but 10,000 of them were uh, locally born, and about 13,000 were from Africa. Now, the importing of African slaves and the short lives of the local Africans meant that they had constant language relearning because they didn't have a stable population. Uh, the stable population generated the language, but to sustain and carry the language through. Plus, all of these um, new slaves coming had to um, relearn language here and there. So we had constant language relearning. The early slaves were from West Africa, and then as the slave trade drifted um, later on to West Central Africa, um, especially Congos, Afghans, and so on. Um, many young Africans came, so young people are more open to language learning. And there was a high death rate, and plus there was marunage that the slaves escaping, for example, the Ijos um, in the Barbies. In, in Demerara, English continued to be the main language, and Robinson quotes from the London Missionary Society in 1807 that the Negroes generally understood English. But he also quotes Reverend John Ray's journal in 1809, which suggests that even though he could speak English to the slaves, they didn't um, totally understand it, so that you had to be careful in speaking with them. Um, he also refers to Reverend, one Reverend Nurse from the Souvenir, who said the Negroes of Demerara speak some Dutch, some English, and some a language compounded of both. And that would be the, the Creole. Um, his conclusion is that the sociolinguistic situation is very complex, involving societal and individual bilingualism, as well as a number of transitional stages between Dutch and English. After the abolition, there was a drastic drop of the supply of slaves, but it was an internal slave trade, which means that slaves were coming out again from um, the Caribbean islands, especially from Marcus and Antigua. But they would have come with a period that they were already speaking, and they had again to um, relearn. Um, the result of abolition was a shift in the population. For example, in 1832, there were 22,000 African-born slaves versus now 43,000 locally born slaves. So the local population was now growing, and with them, the language was being um, consolidated. So they were speaking of Creole. Um, the reduction in the numbers of the slaves coming would have meant that the language would have time now to um, stabilize. The British movement also, 1839 to 1850, compounded creolization because a number of the Africans now moved off into the villages. By 1842, 16,000 of Africans in the village. By 1847, 29,000. By 1848, and so on, 1850, about 44,000. And by um, 1850, they dropped a bit. So 40 to 50,000 Africans on the plantation, on the villages. The villages were independent areas. Um, but they also lived to form the areas of contact between the Chinese, Portuguese, and the course East Indians. And um, Jenkins in the 1870s said that there were a large number of black persons in different villages, and they applied their trade as village secretaries or lawyers. Now, the Africans would go, some of them would learn writing and go wrong. And if you had a problem and you wanted to write to the governor or something, they would write all the letters for you and they would write it in a very florid, extravagant style, copying the style of the English. Um, but the first black newspapers also came from that time, uh, from 1842. So they were able to command English that much to be able to publish newspapers that had good circulation. 
and then a, 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 a raft of other publications in the 19th century. Um, so we had more population, more blacks coming, um, and free blacks now working in Hawkesbury and agriculture and so on. And then between 1843 to 1917, we had about 300, over 300,000 migrants from India, China, Madeira, Europe, and also Africa. Um, so we had a stable period, but with a new population coming in, we had education and the work of the missionaries and uh, compulsory education from 1896 um, that could now be purporting to be teaching uh, English. And um, now let's look quickly uh, at the whites. Um, as we said, there were many English and English-speaking Creole laborers coming from the Caribbean. Um, but many of these persons who came, apart from the planters and so on, many of them were not speakers of standard English. And this is uh, something that we have to be um, clear about. Um, we have the image that the white man was here speaking perfect standard English. That was not the case. The rich, educated white people were out in England. They had lawyers and others here acting as their agents and as overseers and so on on their estates. Many of them were illiterate, many of them came from the lower classes, many of them came from different regions of England where different dialects of English were being spoken, not British, not London English. Um, many of them came from Ireland and Scotland, etc. So this notion of English has to be expanded and um, looked at some more. By 1746, you only had 116 whites out of a total population of 3,500. It increased slightly to 570, but look at the local population from 3,476 to 19,000. So the whites were always a minority. In 1829, 3,000 whites out of a population of 78,000 and more in the Marar and Esquivel. And of course, the English that came to us was not the present day, so you can't compare our people with the present day standard English. You have to compare it with 17th and 18th century English. All right, um, just some of the things that came from English, for example, men do nothing. It was actually present in all the forms of English. This double negative that they say that we have that they say not English was present in all the forms of English. The pronunciation of some words like boy, we say by. That pronunciation was present in all the forms of English. Um, this, this pronunciation of car, car, was considered to be excellent pronunciation in 19th century English. All right? So when we compare our Creole to English, we need to know which English to compare it with, and we have to go back to some of these historic things. Um, the whites, but quickly, the whites were in public service and business and law and medicine, apart from being planters and overseers. There were also poor whites who were functionaries, mechanics and clerks and shop assistants and so on. Um, but there was still a clear race division between the poor whites and even the free blacks, um, so that there wasn't any language learning across the two groups. By 1913, Philip Sandro could suggest that the poor whites had disappeared from the Murara. He went to Barbados and found poor whites, but he was reflecting that he couldn't find the poor whites in uh, the Murara. So we're at a socio-economic level, you might have had some contacts between whites and blacks. The whites um, removed themselves from there. Portuguese from 1834, East Indian from 1838, Chinese from 1843, and also other whites. Um, but the Portuguese and Chinese moved quickly off into business and into the urban centers. Um, by, by 1852, they had owned most of the businesses in Demerara and Esquibo. And so the Portuguese and the Chinese moved away from the blacks. And um, you don't find such a great impact on the Creole. And of course, they would have had to learn the Creole to accommodate the black customers. Indigenous peoples, missionaries, to the Moravians in 1738. 
um, working of the Burmese River, and then we had the London Missionary Society in the Abu Dhabi in 1808. Other missionaries working not only with indigenous peoples, but also with the slaves and also with uh, East Indians. Um, a little quotation from Barrington Brown, who in 1876, in the Cuyuni, found uh, some of the Akowayos speaking English and Dutch up to 1876, Little English and Dutch. And in Bartika, finding a Mapushi Indian who can speak English a little and Dutch at what. So even among the Amherst who had to this influence of uh, European language, languages. Vincent Roth, 1907, um, in the say the Caribs there are everyone willing to speak English, but they double away in their own language. And said few the few the cars could speak speak English and then at Kabakaburi, he said it was very really hard to tell what was Arawak from what was English or Dutch or Spanish, which reflected uh, a great loss of language. He seen this quickly from Bengal and that whole area there. Um, they were bound to the population and had to the to the plantation had limited contact with other populations. Um, for certain reasons, they were allowed to practice their own cultures, and they had the representatives to interface between them and the whites. They later moved off the estates and into lands that had been open for them, um, so that by 1921, over 50% 50, 50 of them were living on the estates, off the estates, of course, in villages where they would have had contacts with Africans. Um, the largest number came from Bihar or Uttar Pradesh, speaking a number of related dialects, um, which, which probably created a lingua franca called Bhojpuri. And the Bhojpuri speakers were first to arrive here. And Gambir suggests that there was a number of dialects, first of all, multi dialectalism, and then those dialects would level out into one dialect, which was, and then that created a Guyanese kind of Hindi called Guyanese Bhojpuri, which we generally call uh, Hindi. Then the government opened lands for East Indians, opened house and years for them, gave them money to return to India and so on, and excluded them from compulsory education, so that the East Indians still remain as a kind of separate population, because they were given certain different conditions. And so they were able to maintain some more of their languages, language. Um, by 1871, we find them living in villages in Georgetown and New Amsterdam, um, living about the plantation. We find them moving away to different kinds of occupations and so on. And a quote from um, one Jenkins who wrote a book on, on East Indians, uh, he said that some of them, the big leaders, the ones who start trouble, were the ones who were speaking a strange language which they call English, but that had to be some kind of um, priorized form of English. Um, so the African languages and the Indian English form the basis of the language. The Dutch Creoles continue to be spoken, um, Professor Robertson found the existence of that. Um, and the different the depressions of the plantation that uh, Professor Gibson spoke about, such as different occupations and so on. All of that led to the, um, contributed to the development of our language. Um, there's a lot of details I have here which I wouldn't go into, but to summarize, um, the language came out of our population development. Um, it came out of the people who are here, and we should include all the persons, black, Amerindians, Chinese, Portuguese, and even whites, in the creation of this language. But we need to understand what were the languages that were brought here. And of, of those, the most important one to understand, of course, is what was actually the English that was uh, spoken. Uh, so that's my presentation. Thank you very much.